back to Colony, the official podcast. I'm your host, Tara Bennett, a senior producer for Sci-Fi Wire. So Bonzo is our penultimate episode of season three, and what a doozy it was, guys. So much to unpack. So let's get into it with co-creator and executive producer Ryan Condal, who also penned this episode. I did. Yes, thank you. And executive producer Wes Took. Good to be here. And we're also thrilled to have with us from maybe his underground ops bunker, the man who set the standard for hyphens in the term multi-hyphenate, Mr. Wayne Brady. Yay! We're super, super happy to have you here. We're so thrilled to be able to talk about your arc. We've had the pleasure of Mr. Kynes' company since the Emerald City, which really started the Seattle arc this season. And so just from the top, I wanted to start by asking how this collaboration came to be. Ryan and Wes, when it came to crafting Everett as a character, was he an amalgamation of public figures that you were thinking of or was he born of something else? We were really interested in the idea of casting somebody on the occupation side that that, um, actually seemed competent. Instead of somebody that was just picked for their moral malleability and skills as a politician, we started crafting this character that was kind of an amalgam of a lot of the, nobody specific, but a lot of the technocrats that you would see and that we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years. You know, they have a certain type. They don't project as somebody that's from society or anything like that, but they're competent. They're incredibly intelligent. They have a very deep skill set and a lot of confidence that comes along with that. And there's also a certain kind of kamikaze-like dedication to their art form. Yeah. And uh, we just started crafting this character, and we really wanted to cast somebody that played against type and played against what you would expect in the role. It took us months of no, no, no. Casting had a bunch of good ideas and crazy ideas. And then just some people that were just character actors that you've seen before. And, oh, what about this? We were just like, we just really want to do something really bold and interesting Mm -hmm. here. And (laughs) And then April pitched us Wayne. And we were like, huh. And then we started thinking about it. And then, and Wayne will talk to this too, but like, he was a fan of the show and came in and read and mm-hmm. like sat in the casting chair with April. And Can I tell my story about that? We we're transported. <laughs> yeah. Well, he came in to read and it's a hard cast because we need someone who's incredibly charismatic mm-hmm. and projects intelligence. It's, it's a very, very hard piece of casting. And we saw Wayne and it suddenly seemed like a really good idea. And then Wayne was coming in and it was a day that the writer's room was on a hiatus. So I was the only person in the office. Mm-hmm. So Wayne came in and I kind of wanted to say, hey, and then he finished. It was really quick and left. And April wandered down the hall and said, oh, Wayne just left. So I ran out of the building like a crazy person. Oh, no. So poor Wayne is like walking across the parking lot and I come bursting out of the building like, Wayne, Wayne! And he turns around this look of heart. I presume I probably have this 10 times a day, Wayne, of, oh my God, I'm being accosted by another fan. And I was like, um, I'm the executive producer on the show and uh, we just really like you. So we came strong out of the gate. Wes came strong out of the gate because he actually broke the gate on his way out the door. I ran so fast. (laughs) (laughs) Couldn't get your keys faster getting into your car. Um, I wanted to ask you, Wayne, so obviously you have an incredibly busy career. You're headlining productions of Hamilton and Kinky Boots and you're hosting Let's Make a Deal and you're on Who's Line still. And so in terms of like your career and space to do a series drama, even for just an arc, was it feasible or was it because you were offered something out of the ordinary and you are an avowed genre fan. I think it's a little bit of all of the above. I loved Colony right from the first time that I saw the trailers on USA before it aired the first season because I'm a big sci-fi genre geek. Like that's where I live there in fantasy and it's always been my want, my wish to be able to do more work in that world. I got a chance a few years ago with Stargate SG-1, and and then uh, I was on a show for a a few episodes last season on sci-fi. But Colony was the perfect blend of sci-fi and real world, which I think is the best way to do genre. The best way to do genre is to make it so grounded that it could be real. And I was a fan from day one. So cut to when I got the ask to come in and audition, I jumped at it, A, because it was a show that I'd already watched the first season of, but also B, I've done a lot of stuff on stage and I've done a few movies, but I think a lot of people and even people in the business, when they think of me, they think of Wayne doing who's line and those things that you said, when at the heart of it, I am an actor and I've done Shakespeare and do drama all the time, but people think of this thing. So it was a no brainer for me to run in and audition. I'm not someone who's too proud to audition. I wouldn't stand there and say, well, I've done such and such. Like, no, you show what you can do. And I think you also show a measure of you're such a fan that you are willing to go in and maybe look like an ass if you don't do a good job. But I just wanted to go in and kill it, maybe be part of the team. So the fact that it turned out the way it was and that Kynes is the person he is, 
It's a win. I'm so happy. It was super fun to have Wayne on set just because you could tell immediately he was a real fan because you get this part and you don't get the follow-up scripts. Right. And he's written incredibly enigmatically. So you're kind of getting these little snippets into his life and these teasers. And it was also really challenging because Wayne was starting out on an island where he wasn't interacting with regulars. And then finally he gets to interact with someone that's Peter, who's a crazy person. Right. So... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Wayne is sitting there in his chair and he's kind of asking, where is his character going to go? And you start to give him little snippets. You get to watch the excitement as he realized the importance of this character within the arc of the show because he knew what was going on in the show. It's not the typical situation where someone's walking in and you're just saying, well, your guy who carries a gun. <laughs> right. It's pretty cool. You know, like he got it. It was Basically, great. Basically, I started giggling. I started giggling. <laughs> a grown ass man giggling in my chair. Everybody in the crew was just so excited to have him. And it was also really cool to see a true professional at work. But you sensed this is not kind of what Wayne does every yeah. day. So, But seeing him take his incredible skill set and then convert it to this and the dedication that he had to getting it right and learning all of our terrible techno jargon that we, uh, <laughs> we force into the mouths of our characters and making it sound natural. And I wish we could write the movie about his interactions with Helena and Snyder because oh. those scenes are just always delighted. Just to watch them get shot and then to play with them in the editing room. It was just great. The headbutting between the two of them. And I mean, in particular, when <laughs> Wayne basically throws them out of his city. I love that. Uh, at the end of, I think, episode 11. Yes. Uh, I love and, that. Uh, identifies Helena as a failed studio executive. And just, I mean, there were some high fives. It was it was master shade amongst yeah. three people trying <laughs> to al alpha each other. Some it was shade <laughs> thrown. It was so great. We just enjoyed it. Well, Wayne, I wanted to ask you again, because as they said, you know, you're coming into a series where Kinds is being revealed literally every single episode until we really see what he's been doing later on in the season. And so you have a choice when you come as an actor. Obviously, you're reading the scripts, but how you decide what type of presence Kynes is going to be is really coming from your choices. He's meta-timely. We're experiencing everything that's going on right now with data analytics and social media, data mining and all of this. But there's a lot of different personalities, as Ryan said, in that spectrum. Where on the spectrum did you immediately decide you wanted to dial in this kind of tech guru? Well, even from the audition, I was told to check out Jeff Bezos. So I looked at a few videos. They sent me a link to casting, sent a link to me, and I checked out Jeff. And what I liked about Jeff was he's kind of a no-nonsense type of guy. And then I just extrapolated from that fact that I wanted to be a guy who was not just no-nonsense, but who wouldn't mind at some point following through those convictions of him being so right that at some point, he would pick up a gun in the fight. Maybe he wouldn't be able to use it as well as everyone else, but he truly believes in his vision and in the world that he was setting up and his being right so much that he would actually pick up arms. And that's not something that's been normal in the way that you normally write the nerd king who sits behind his yes. keyboard ruling things. He would send everyone else out and be the master of machinations as opposed to, okay, you know, we got to get this done. So if I've got to fight, then I've got to fight. And I love that about him. I really love that. He's got this awesome, beautiful, window-laden kind of lair that he works in. But we get the little pieces like he's got the guitars. He's got little personality things. Was there anything that you guys discussed and what you wanted to see in the playing of it? And then also Ryan and Wes on what you wanted to show, just in little kernels with the visuals about who this guy is. Yeah, there was a lot of thought that went into the set deck in his office because mm -hmm. that was going to be our window into him. And we also knew in the back of our heads that Peter eventually was going to take over the office yeah. and the opportunity for him to play guitar was going to be pretty great. So, <laughs> yeah. yep. Peter playing with the <laughs> priceless musical artifacts so every time he came to his office and just seeing Kynes die inside every time he touched his stuff it was great. We'd also gone to the EMP on the scouting trip to look at Seattle, and mm -hmm. some of that yeah. stuff was jammed into our heads and said, if you were the ruler of Seattle and add an interest in pop culture, surely the first thing you'd do would be raid the EMP for stuff for your office. Right, sure. yeah, that's Paul Allen's pop culture Pop culture museum, museum. exactly, yeah, just, yes. just great. <laughs> a lot of these guys are very casual. Mm -hmm. They're excited kids that got to do their dream for a living. These aren't people that have been soul deadened through yeah, exactly. years of law school and MBAs and everything else. So we wanted to infuse the character with a little bit of that, and we saw him as a collector, classic rock fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you pour through the episodes, there's a bunch of references to that. I mean, the name of this episode is a particular reference in that world and uh, how he names his facilities and keeps them categorized and codenamed and all that. It brought a lot of interesting things to the character that set him very much aside from the Helenas and the Snyders of the world who probably don't enjoy anything other than watching their opponents bleed. <laughs> Traditional bureaucrats from soul-crushing bureaucracies. <laughs> yes, correct. Either junior college system or the studio system. <laughs> 
Perfect. Correct. Yeah, one or the <laughs> other is going to get them there. Exactly. Is Bonzo John Bonham? Yes. Ah. Very specifically, Bonzo was the personality that Bonham would take on ah. after 17 or so beers. <laughs> There was like the genius behind the drum kit and the guy that was one of the most likable people in the band. And then there was the, um, they had like don't tell Bonzo parties because he would come and break everything in the room and scare away all the groupies and everything. So so legendary. Yeah. Was there anything? Rest uh, in peace. Yes, rest in peace. Uh, Wayne, was there anything for you that you adopted in terms of helping get you into the psyche or just the skin of kinds that came from the environment? You know, some actors lean on that, some don't. What was it for you? This is one of the rare times when I've been on a set and I didn't have to ask for anything because it was already there. The way that the fellas built out that world of his office, those are the exact things that I would have in my own office. And there was very much a similarity. And I liked what they were saying about how um, guys like that, tech savvy, they are big kids. Because I think when you reach a point in the entertainment business or in the tech business, you are basically talking to a bunch of adults who have worked very hard and who now have the money to get the things that they couldn't when they were kids, which is why you have creators with Lego sets <laughs> and stand-up video games. It's the same thing with music equipment. I love the fact that he loved music so much that he had the guitar and then his computers were at the top of the line and it was comfort. It's almost like a big boy clubhouse which is exactly what I would build myself. So I thought it was great. We actually drew the blueprint for Wayne to take over Seattle now. <laughs> He's thinking about moving up there. I'll be talking to you later <laughs> from Seattle, where I will be taking over the Space Needle at my own recording studio. Great. Please include Wes and I in your regime. <laughs> oh, done deal. We can write. We can't do really much else. But They've offered <laughs> themselves as minions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wayne, leading up to episode 12, were there any moments for you leading up to the climax where we've got the bunker and such that allowed you to flesh him out in a way that you just really loved or appreciated? We talked a little bit about some of the moments with Snyder and Helena, but were there any other ones where you were like, oh, that was a good moment leading into us really getting to know as you get deeper into these later episodes of who he is? I think the moment, and we addressed it a little bit earlier, I think uh, one of the moments that I really loved was when I got a chance to tell Snyder and Helena off, because I think at that point, you really see that he's not playing, that he's willing to go head to head for real, as opposed to earlier, everything was done with the polite face that everyone is putting on their best savage niceties. Yeah. And oh, yes, 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 ah, ha, 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 going head to head. And then I really like the scene where I offered him a protection because you're so important. And looking at someone, and I paraphrase, but looking at someone like that and just saying, oh, no, 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 I'm giving you uh, that security because I wouldn't want anything to happen to you because you're so important, because you're so great. Just digging at Snyder and vying for that upper hand. Those are the scenes that I love because I feel that the viewer wanted to then see who would get the upper hand in this game going back and forth and when is that break going to happen. And I loved playing those moments. That was really cool. And just as a fan of action and the suspense, when I finally got a chance to get to the bunker, it's like, oh my God, I get to hold the gun. It's going to, oh no, it's going down now. <laughs> like, that felt so cool. Well, you got the dueling pistol in Hamilton, didn't you? Yeah, but I knew that it wasn't going to go off. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, on the losing end, right? Not an automatic weapon. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got a, yeah it's big boy guns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I love that sequence in 11, which culminates in him confronting Helena and Snyder outside the building. We don't do that a lot where we stick with one character all the way through the run of an act. And Tim, who shot it, was incredibly thoughtful about how we we're going to string it together. And it's this build. It's basically the he's left the building sequence. And the way it is shot, and if you look at those transitions and how they move from one to another, and there's this incredibly kind of touching moment on the page. It's two lines of dialogue. Mm -hmm. But Wayne really found it when he goes in and says goodbye to the technology officer. Yeah. The way they look at each other, and he calls him Ev, and there's just kind of this moment of humanity before he goes out and cuts these people down. And you realize that the reason he's cutting them down is because this is personal. And what has made him different as a character from a lot of these other characters is that he does care about it. It's not just a game. And he kind of despises the people who play it as a game. Right. So juxtaposing those two scenes next to each other where you see that slice of humanity and then that's what's motivating his anger. It's not smart to say those things necessarily on the way out the door. Just walk out the door and leave them with the mystery. But mm -hmm. he's so infuriated by their approach to everything that is happening. He can't let it go. That's Well, something. and also Kynes is incredibly proud of this thing that he's built in Seattle. And it's this years of work and yeah. planning that he did to undermine this horrible Vichy government. And right. there was nothing that we could do to repel the invasion, but there was definitely a different future possible for humanity. It's that the vipers that they picked chose a certain future that mm -hmm. enriched them 
themselves at the expense of everybody else. But he saw a chance to take lemons and make lemonade. And he had been working on this so hard in Seattle. And then Snyder and Helena show up and lay it to ruin in days, weeks. Yeah. I think there's this real sense of mourning. It's a great scene with him and Morrow when he says goodbye to him in the server room. It's not just two friends saying goodbye to one another, but it's also saying goodbye to this vision that they had because they know that whatever is coming in the future, it's not going to be what they had planned. Something that any entrepreneur would understand, mm -hmm. right? Versus an elected official who's just apparently now just in office just to get reelected. And yeah. that's the only concern that anybody has ever yeah. is the next two years or the six years or the four years ahead. Yeah. But Kynes is there and just as he did probably with his business in the pre-rap world, mm -hmm. uh, pre-Mork world now that Mork we're in Seattle. World, yes. He's now built this new business in terms of the Seattle colony and he's bidding farewell to that. Kynes also brings to the series a very different look at the resistance because it's a long game. Most of the time we're watching everybody just trying to exist in the now. But he had the vision and he had the wherewithal and he had the finances to be able to craft what he determines to be the potential for humanity down the line. It's telling when Broussard says to Amy in this episode that he thinks that the balance will shift, will come through somebody like Kynes. And that's a really interesting thing to explore for a show where everybody's just been trying to get through the next moment. Hopefully that's the drama at the end of the episode when he's shot. He mm -hmm. realized that this is the one person in the show we've ever encountered with a plan that feels hopeful or positive. Right. And their life is literally hanging the balance as we exit. And that knows more than any human being that we've met in the show. Yeah. And probably will meet. And that's all up there in his head. And now we don't know whether he's going to be able to let us in on those secrets. I wanted to go back to the cold open, too. We really get to see a real sci-fi moment. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about the idea of revealing what you need to reveal to us. And also, Wayne just talking about getting to play such a, a really awesomely framed moment that really enlightens us into this other alien species that we have only gotten to any glimpses at. We wanted to pull out all the stops with this one and give the fans this, as you said, true science fiction moment. And Jeremy Sambridge, our production designer, and his team just did this unbelievable so job great. building these things. Where oh, it was amazing. <laughs> we had to convince everybody involved that uh, we're going to come back here. And we kind of said it and then sort of like side-eyed each other mm -hmm. because we had no idea whether we're ever going to come back here. But no, that was a very expensive thing to do. Yeah, that it was. We have this very clear vision, which we proposed, which right. is that the alien eventually is going to turn into an analyst mm -hmm. and you're going to go in and this be kind of soprano style and the characters one by one are going to kind of go in and unburden themselves so we're really going to use it for a lot of <laughs> that's right that's right for yeah. the whole the, the season i uh, can totally uh, see those yeah. moments across each other from a chair what off we it, go what was that in treatment that hbo show it's just that <laughs> yeah. wow i with, like that with the demi sitting on the other side no but we uh we envisioned this very high-tech prison and they had captured one of these things and had it in captivity and obviously had gone to great lengths to keep it separate from other people, not only because of what she might know, but also because of the obvious danger when humans come within contact of it. So we were just really interested in like, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And what is a human made prison for this thing that we don't even understand look like? And where is it? And all that. And it was just, oh, just a gorgeous. It was my favorite set that I've ever really? stepped onto in the world of Colony. It was just so distinct and science fiction and just glorious. So it was great to see. And, uh, you know, it's episode 12 of season three. It's time to start seeing some cool stuff. We hope everybody enjoyed it because we sure enjoyed making it. And Wayne, with you getting to play in that moment, it's one of those moments where I'm sure you look at the page and you go, OK, this, I'm going to have to see when it's all done, <laughs> how it plays out, because it's all mental. It is one of those things where I can truly say that you don't have to be artsy fartsy and actory with it because you can be. You know, <laughs> oh, I'm going to front myself with this stuff. The reality of it is, as a child, I ran around playing that I was a superhero encountering alien races all the time. I was Buck Rogers trapped on a planet. I was um, trapped in Atlantis meeting the mer people. I was always doing this stuff anyway. So it was so easy for me to put myself in the position of, oh my God, look at this alien. And now I feel such waves of power that I'm getting sick. It was so much fun. It was so much fun to put on that suit and walk through the little hatch and see her. I think that's the most fun I had the entire time because I was truly pretending to be the thing that I wanted to be ever since I was a kid. Oh, that's so great. That's amazing. That's and great. it looks awesome. Yeah, it evokes like Stanley Kubrick, yeah. Chris Nolan, even the way it's shot. Yes. Charlotte Brandstrom, who directed the episode, did an amazing job. That's exactly it. It was so 2001 going into that hatch 
I think the funniest part of this for me was not the pretending to be sick or the pretending to see her. And it's the, in Charlotte's accent, I'm going to do a horrible accent, but her saying, no, 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 I, I, I need more, more of the spitting, more puke. <laughs> and it has to go, it has to go in the store. I need, I need one, blah, blah, blah. okay, so you want me to go, blah, blah, blah. okay. And we did multiple takes where I would try to go, blah, blah, and time it so it looked a certain way and then I was laughing my butt off because it's such a silly thing to know that you're getting paid to do this and this is your job. It was absolutely awesome. And then the poor cleanup crew had to come up and, and <laughs> swap uh, the deck. <laughs> <laughs> the Hadron Collider room that he was in. Little <laughs> Ethernet cables just uh, picking fake vomit out of it. I loved it. I loved it. I want to circle around a little bit, too, to what's going on with the Bowmans in this episode. We really do get the John Wick version of Will at a certain point. It's, he tells Katie that she's a liability. He says the kids are better off without me. The interesting thing to explore with a person like Will is that he is such a wonderful father and family man when he has to be that. But he does come from a place where he's a trained killer. Yeah. He's worked in a field that he has done awful things. And to transition from one to the other can't be a smooth transition. It feels like that's this is an offshoot of that. Ryan's just writing autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> You're in a dark place by episode 12 of 13 episode season, Tara. I gotta tell you. TV takes it out Ooh, of you by then. It takes a toll. <laughs> um, Will is this incredibly damaged man at this point. And what we've been showing since Charlie's death in episode five is that he's not getting better. He's having these fits and starts. We've talked about this before where we wrote him this season post Charlie's demise as an addict instead of pills or booze or whatever. In this case, he's addicted to his own rage or his grief. Mm -hmm. And he keeps trying to sate it with drowning Snyder in a toilet and whatever. Now he's found this cause of resistance, which he had always rejected before and in fact accused his wife of not caring for the safety of their family before for her own idealism. And now he's pursuing it not as an idealist. He's pursuing it because this is just a place where I can direct my really toxic energy. And in this episode, you see it come to light. And this is, you know, this is man on fire. Just, yeah. just this enraged father with no regard for his own life or the life of the men beside him. I mean, just really throwing away all the things that he's been taught over his life as a professional. And this thing will play very viscerally, I think, to the audience. I think the video game crowd will be like very charged up seeing this incredible thing, but it's supposed to be really horrifying. It is I horrifying. Mean, just this guy who once was this great family man who only killed because he had to. And you've always felt like Will has, in a way, all of these deaths that he's been around and experienced and dealt out have stayed with him in a way, whereas this is just a guy just cutting through everything, everything he can. And this episode was supposed to put him in a place where he basically walks to the edge of the abyss and then stares into it. And he's either going to fall in or get pushed in. We just don't know whether he's going to come back or not. And that's why you have that beautiful final shot of the episode, which I just, I just love is this guy who's bleeding quite badly. Curfew sirens going off. He's got no help, no backup. We just don't know where he's going to be or where he's going to land. Talking about a three-act movie, this is the Dark Knight of the Soul. The lowest low, low point of Act 2. And the question is, what's going to happen in Act 3? Where is the character going to go? Is he going to find redemption? Is he going to pull himself out of this? Is somebody else going to rescue him from it? Or is he just going to answer the call of the darkness? Right. And I also love that Katie is in this very interesting place where she's effectively abandoned by her husband, by her resistance cell, because Broussard also says, no, go be with your kids. And then her kids, she's sleeping and everybody leaves her. And there's a mighty big price for the choices that you make. In some ways, some people could judge her and her working in the Seattle block as being collaboration and this is the price you pay. Tell me about what you wanted to say with that moment of her ultimately just alone. Yeah, I mean, it's a tragedy for Katie. And in the past, I think her character, she's done a lot of things that put herself, or at least her ideology, what she believed in first, ahead of everything else. Whereas in this season, the role has very much been reversed. Will is kind of the loose cannon that's flying around, dangerous to everybody around him. And Katie's the one that's trying to keep it together. You know, she's taken on this role as a collaborator. Yes, to sort of help her, help her family, but it, it's a good job. All the excuses that Will would have used in season one for signing up with the occupation. And now she's just done it to try to keep everything together, realizing that I'm the only one here that's going to do it and maybe a little bit of Bram too. And it's just blown up in her face. It hasn't worked. Her husband's a lost cause. Her son is angry and hasn't been dealt with. And then her daughter is also feeling cut loose and neglected. And maybe Bram is the only one really looking out for me. And in that moment, you know, when Gracie leaves with Bram, she just trusts her brother more than she trusts her parents. Mm -hmm. And it's sad. I mean, it's tragic. 
This family has been destroyed by this awful thing that's happened to them, the grief and the piling on of all this trauma that they've had over the course of this whole occupation. That final beat of them walking out and leaving her alone, it's partially Katie's fault, but part of it's just the universe has gone against her in this way. And I particularly love the scene where Will leaves the house and tells her she's a liability and tells her that she needs to stay home and give her energy to the kids because he's basically, he's trying to protect her right. in like this last way that he can. And yeah. not only protect her, but protect the protect family. The family the like kids. he senses that he's become this hand grenade that's liable to go off at any time. He's a danger to everybody around him. So he wants to remove himself from the family situation. He's basically considers himself, he doesn't expect to live through this thing. He's going on a suicide mission. And he doesn't want Katie to come along with him because he wants to protect what's left of the family and her and everything else. He's nasty to her in this way. The way you'd like, you'd throw rocks at a dog to try to yeah, you know, try totally. get out of here. Be free. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the scene plays like this incredibly brutal, I think almost misogynistic turn, but right. really in his own dark way, it's Will trying with one last breath to save what's left of his family. This is an incredibly challenging episode to shoot. Arguably the most challenging episode we ever had. It was huge. It was a lot of action. There was also a lot of character scenes. Right. It was sprawling. And Charlotte did such a fantastic job. But that sequence in particular, if you think about taking it from this intimate character scene in a bedroom, mm -hmm. the way that camera follows them down the stairs and then peeks over the balcony to catch them. Peyton yeah. walks up and delivers, which is my favorite line of the season, which is she's going to excuse herself, which is a brief moment of levity before you have the confrontation with Broussard. Yeah. And then you pick Katie up and walk out the door to that car and then the car pulls out. If you just think about the choreography of that and how she's staying in Katie's emotions and breaking it briefly in the middle and then moving on. And she's an incredibly talented director you know, obviously in both the action and drama of it. And we just, we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. Yeah, I mean, it was like a 12-day schedule that she had to make in eight days. So it was just, it was insane. And yeah. all those little pieces. And we had this one facility in Vancouver that was called the Fortress. Mm -hmm. It was really basically their version of a Federal Reserve facility. So it was condemned, you know, not condemned because it's dangerous. It was set to be demoed to <laughs> probably build a condo complex because that's all they're building in Vancouver. <laughs> and uh, it's so expensive to knock it down because the walls are so thick. They yeah. would have to blow it up and hit it with special equipment and everything. So it's this amazing facility that looks like 17 different locations because every room is different. It's just a bizarre, really interesting place. And we had full run of the facility. So we just used every part of the Buffalo in this episode, shooting right. it out and making it look like this really densely built bunker that Kynes had created out of this old Federal Reserve building in Seattle. Yeah, it was really epic. And Wayne, bringing it back to you, Kynes, he gets hit at the end of this episode. And uh, just in terms of you guys having a conversation about where the character would go, were you aware of it? Or it was one of those uh, oh, hey, let me read the script and find out what happens with them. And then the interest of someone that literally has lived in a, a glass castle also being vulnerable. All the money in the world and all the intelligence still doesn't protect him from what's happening in the streets. Yeah, you uh, nailed it on the head. It's exactly that. It was so great to read that moment because I didn't know that he was going to get hit. I was just hoping that he wasn't going to get hit and die on the spot. So I'm happy that he has survived so far as we know. But I loved playing, or well, not playing it, because it happened to me. Not um, I didn't play it, but getting shot. Not all the money in the world can protect you, but I truly believe that the way that his art was presented, you walked away with the picture of a man that wouldn't have changed anything about that. He had to put himself in the line of fire with the rest of his guys. That's why he was escaping with the rest of them to try to get to the ambulance. He wasn't trying to hide. I think that he was hit because he didn't mind putting himself out there. And what an honor to play somebody with that type of uh, fortitude. I'm sure that he would have rather not been hit, but he was empowering. And I love that piece of it. And I love the fact that he had that long-ranging plan that he had an ambulance waiting. I thought that was so genius, the way that was written. So it speaks a lot to life. You can prepare for every eventuality, but in the end, the best laid plans are my men. Well, it was an absolute joy getting to watch you this season and a joy to talk to you and be able to dig into this nerd role for you this season. We are so appreciative of you being able to come in and talk about Everett and uh, and give us your time and uh, let's get you in more nerdy things. <laughs> He's the king of the nerds. <laughs> He's the king uh, of the nerds. It's good to be the king. We are your people, Wayne. Come and visit me in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Space Needle tickets bought. Uh, thank you again so much for being with us, Wayne. And as always, thank you, Ryan and Wes, for dissecting this episode in such a smart and intelligent way. And uh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, fellas. 
And as always, I gotta give it up for my podcast team, including producer Bartley Taylor, producer editor Paul Terry, our mixer and master Dave Draper, and for the network studios for being a recording home. And thank you so much for listening to our podcast. We appreciate every single download, all the comments, and we hope you come back with us next week. 